At this week's World Trade Organization meeting, governments from all over the world are promoting free trade. Protectionism has been a dirty word ever since the Great Depression, when countries closed their borders with the aim of protecting jobs and industries, and failed. Since then, free trade has gained a lot of ground. And on the face of it, it's a very difficult idea to argue against. Britain's Secretary of State for Trade and Industry, Ian Lang, has no intention of doing so. I believe that Britain now, being so competitive, being so committed to a worldwide trade and investment, should seek to advance the trade liberalisation agenda, which can so obviously benefit us. But it does go wider than that. Trade liberalisation benefits the country with whom one is trading, as well as oneself. I think that the promotion of economic growth, the raising of living standards in other countries as well as at home, is a worthwhile target to set. In keeping with a long British tradition, this government is pushing a vision of global free trade. They call it 2020, the date by which they'd like to see a world market come into being. And they're not alone. Politicians across the world have taken up the cause of free trade. Former Mexican trade minister Jaime Serra led his country through a period of radical trade liberalization. Mexico was, for many, many years, a highly protected economy. And that created major distortions in the country. And um, the development of the country was going in uh, the direction of an isolated economy. Today, the development of the Mexican economy is much more in tune with the rest of the world. What has happened to Mexican exports is rather impressive. Today, Mexico supplies more apparel to the American market than China. And as you know, the production of apparel creates a lot of jobs. So free trade has created jobs in Mexico, and it has allowed Mexico to export more. The great attraction of free trade is that, in theory, everyone stands to win. As consumers, we'll get cheaper goods in our shops. As workers, we'll produce what we're best at. Poor countries will get more of a chance to develop. And perhaps best of all, consumers and markets will decide what's made where and for what price, not politicians. No wonder free trade seems so popular, yet there are still protectionists around. It seems to me quite obvious that one should protect one's community, one's local economy, which provides an economic infrastructure for one's community, and one's natural environment. What amazes me is the astonishing logic of those who think that protecting these essential things is a crime. Edward Goldsmith is a writer, environmental campaigner, and occasional advisor to his brother James, the leader of the referendum party. What we've done is to destroy domestic economies everywhere by incorporating them completely into the global economy. It's not just a global economy that complements the domestic economy on which people live. It's the domestic economy being merged with it. It's the domestic economy disappearing, being replaced by the global economy. There's no worse method of distributing resources throughout the world than via free trade on a global level. This is a very extreme view, which rejects not just free trade, but many aspects of modern development. But there are other more pointed arguments against free trade. On the right of the political spectrum, in many countries, some very loud voices have started promoting protectionism. And even in the centre, there are murmuring doubts about trade. Suzanne Berger is Professor of Political Science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and author of a recent study of trade and national differences. She sees a trend here. I think that the links between domestic problems and trade are perhaps the single most important issue, a rising issue on the political agenda in all of our countries. We saw it in the United States with what we heard from Ross Perot and from Pat Buchanan. Uh, I think in France, people like Le Pen and the uh, president of the National Assembly, Philippe Seguin, have emphasized very heavily that the beginning of a new policy really depends on building border level barriers to unregulated trade flows and immigrant flows. I think people really have come to believe that there's a new politics in the making and that this is politics on the frontiers. What's new about free trade today is that it affects every part of our lives and society. A hundred years ago, what we call protection was guaranteed by distance. Ships arrived laden with wines and delicacies and left filled with cloth and textiles. But trade didn't intrude on every aspect of life. Today, most of the Christmas crackers, fireworks, children's toys and clothes you're buying were probably made in China or Hong Kong. Even your insurance or telephone company might be based offshore. 
and trade isn't just affecting what you can buy. The need to compete internationally is affecting the way we organize society, jobs, and even culture. Far from offering an easy prescription for mutual gains, free trade is giving politicians a new set of headaches. Edward Lutbach is senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, a think tank in Washington, D.C. He argues that there's a strong case for protectionism. The advocates of free trade are forever trying to prove that uh, other things being equal, free trade will increase total income of countries. And, of course, they're quite right. And then they stop and then they go home and end the story. What the advocates of free trade systematically refuse to take into account are two things. First, that some people will, in fact, lose. Workers, let's say, are thrown out of jobs, lose jobs because of imports, far more serious, far more profound, and even dangerous is the impact on society and on culture. Behind every protectionist barrier, whether it is farmers in northern Japan, or, you know, craftsmen in Italy, or whatever it is, behind each barrier, people live. And the people who live behind protectionist trade barriers very often are the people who embody what is older in a culture rather than newer. And that may, in fact, have a very important role. Barriers can protect many things we cherish and value. For some, this means farming and rural villages. The argument is that these are more than just economic activities. They're part of a national tradition. Often for cultural reasons, farmers in Europe and the United States, rice farmers in Japan, have been subsidized and protected. But do they have a compelling case? Professor Jagdish Bhagwati of Columbia University is one of the world's leading experts on the economics of trade. I've always felt that the Japanese argument on, on rice being important for the rich or it is grossly ridiculous, actually, for a highly modern society like Japan to say, we can't have your rice. Um, I mean, it just doesn't cut much ice uh, in my book. And I think it is purely protectionism, so masquerading under a cultural argument. And finally, they've given it up. I think if they have carried final weight and said, look, we just can't hack it because most agricultural lobbies are very strong. And in Japan, it's even stronger because of the way the politics was set up. But the proponents of protectionism argue that without it, it's not just our rural communities that will wither. It's society as we know it and what holds it together. It's not just how we look after farmers, but how we look after the poorest and weakest. Certainly, the welfare state is starting to look uncompetitive in terms of world trade. The small town built around a particular industry is being sacrificed for higher tech jobs for a different group of people in the city. Inequalities are growing between those who have the higher tech jobs and the lesser skilled who are losing out to factories in Asia. Adrian Wood, professor at the Institute of Development Studies, Sussex University, has studied this process closely. What's happened is that the tremendous expansion of trade in manufacturers with developing countries, particularly the large increase in manufactured exports from developing countries, which are mainly concentrated on labor-intensive goods uh, has displaced large numbers of low-skilled manufacturing workers from jobs in developed countries and that's tended to drive down the level of unskilled wages in developed countries and to raise levels of unemployment among unskilled workers. All economists agree that free trade displaces some workers. They disagree over how many. Adrian Wood has recently published a major study arguing that free trade has a large adverse effect on equality and employment. The kind of statistical research that I've done produces results which are much more consistent with what you see on the ground in terms of factories closing, the reasons why they closed, the reasons their workforces were reduced, uh, and what happened to the workers who were displaced. I mean, there, I think most people would say labor-intensive imports from low-wage countries have caused a lot of factory closures, have displaced a lot of unskilled workers, and it is the contraction of unskilled employment in manufacturing, particularly for males, that is largely responsible for the widening inequalities in the labor market that we've seen in developed countries over the last couple of decades.
And I've just done a series of calculations which comes up with numbers that are consistent with the popular view of what has happened. I believe that employment is like water and it runs downhill. Tom Donahue is the former president of the AFL-CIO, America's Federation of Unions. He played a major role in the negotiation of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, signed in 1992. Given an employer a choice between paying a higher wage and a lower wage, he's going to choose the lower wage, and so he's going to move if, you know, within, there are differences within industries as to what's possible. But these days, much of manufacturing is quite portable and quite movable, and I was quite concerned and remain concerned that that will be the course of events, that American jobs will move as they have moved to uh, Asia, to other places in Latin America. They've moved to low-wage countries. This affects the core bargains upon which our society is structured, between workers and their bosses, between companies and governments. Critically, not everyone is affected in the same way by free trade. Firms become more mobile, but workers don't. While firms can cross borders in search of profits, it's much harder for people to move in search of jobs. But let's not exaggerate the extent to which firms actually move. A very measured assessment is given by Vincent Cable, chief economist at Shell International. If you look at the factors which determine why multinational companies invest overseas, there are two major reasons for that. One is to be close to the markets. A lot of companies, for example, currently investing in China, not because China has low wages, but because China is a very big, rapidly growing country, and Western companies want to be part of that. Another reason why big companies invest overseas, particularly resource companies, mining, oil industry, is, is to be close to those resources. And the third reason, which is to take advantage of low labor costs, is a relatively minor factor. It only operates in one or two sectors, and I would argue is a relatively trivial reason why companies migrate overseas. What's not trivial is the impact that's left behind when companies move overseas. Whatever their reason for moving, they leave in their wake lost jobs, emptier towns, and a problem for the advocates of free trade who argued that everyone would benefit from it. If free trade is to benefit everyone, then some of the gains have to be directed to those who lose their jobs. It's sorry comfort to offer them the thought that workers in other countries or other sectors might be benefiting. So how can governments ensure that everyone wins? Edward Lutvak. Economic analysis immediately shows that it's much better to support directly any group you may wish to support as opposed to doing so by protectionism. But it never happens, and it never happens for a very obvious reason. In a democratic political system, you're rarely going to have a majority willing uh, to devote money to sustain a specific narrow minority. In Europe, whenever you had uh, the removal of trade barriers uh, because of uh, free trade enthusiasms, the people that suffered because of this and sometimes suffered catastrophically were never given compensation or support or alternatives. So why is it that people will support protectionism but not more targeted, more efficient measures to protect their culture? Well, this is where the economists obviously are a very strong ground, and that is that protectionism historically has been supported by um, evoking nationalist uh, notions by, to put it uh, in the most negative terms, uh, industries that want to enjoy the profits and comforts and ease and security of protectionism find ways of wrapping the flag around their industry. There's a direct clash here between what's right and what's possible. Economists agree that we should target the losers carefully and compensate them, for example by retraining them and helping them to find new jobs. But as most displaced workers don't have the political power to demand compensation, it's far more tempting for them to join with their bosses, wrap themselves in the flag and push for some kind of protectionism that will save their jobs. Today this is not likely to be tariffs. In successive rounds of trade negotiations, industrialized countries have virtually eradicated tariffs. Governments who want to protect something now use much subtler instruments. They can get smaller trade partners to sign voluntary agreements not to export too much. They can impose fines for supposedly unfair trade. Or they can set high standards of labor or environmental protection. These were issues in the NAFTA negotiations. Unions in the United States successfully pushed for side agreements on labor conditions. Tom Donahue was the man who negotiated them.
we never argued and don't argue today that uh, there should be a leveling up of all wages in the world. That's an impossible dream. I think that over time, provided the workers of these other countries around the world are allowed to unionize and allowed to be represented in collective bargaining, they will raise their own standard of living and their own levels of wages uh, within the confines of the economy in which they function. And that's the appropriate measure that we fight for, that they be allowed to form and join their unions and to negotiate to improve their lot. But did you find during NAFTA that Mexican unions listened to that argument? I mean, surely they wanted the free trade agreement. Yes, they did. And the, the Mexican unions, uh, in the final analysis, the Mexican unions supported their government in the negotiations of NAFTA. And in discussions between the American and the Mexican unions, we agreed early on that each of us had the obligation to represent our own workers. Hardly workers of the world unite. In free trade negotiations, the battle all too quickly becomes our workers versus your workers. But isn't there a strong moral argument for defending workers' rights all over the world, for reducing exploitation and ensuring that everywhere workers enjoy at least a right to unionize and not to be discriminated against? Furthermore, if we don't ensure these rights are respected everywhere, then in theory at least, free trade permits even our own companies to circumvent such standards by shifting production overseas. Yet, even though there's a good argument for pushing for higher labour standards, Suzanne Berger believes that some supporters have mixed motives. The labour movement in the United States has been in such trouble, and there are parts of the United States where it's virtually impossible to form a union, so that we should insist on the possibility of union rights in Mexico or in other societies is a kind of odd double standard. It's to me, rather ironic that the, the leader of the movement for what's been known as the Magna Carta of textile rights is a southern industrialist in the United States who himself has always refused to allow a union in his own plants. And the Magna Carta of textile rights includes as one of its planks the notion that uh, workers must be allowed to collectively bargain. Nevertheless, Suzanne Berger sees some virtue in basic labor standards. Yet many economists disagree. Jagdish Bhagwati calls them the new white man's burden, the burden of protecting cushy living conditions in advanced industrialized countries. He's not alone. Jaime Serra, Mexico's former trade minister. To try to identify trade sanctions for those countries that have lower degrees of uh, environmental care or lower labor standards, in my view, is a mistake. It has been found empirically that those countries that go uh, beyond certain degree of development improve their labor standards and their environmental standards as they grow up, as their per capita income goes up, as they develop. And if you were to take underdeveloped countries, less developed countries, and ask them uh, to start taking care immediately of their environment and labor standards and otherwise blocking their products, you would really be condemning them or dooming them into not developing enough to improve their standards on labor and environment. If it's so clear that free trade can help country develop and as it develops, it improves its labor and environment standards, then why have industrialized countries not accepted this argument? My sense is that it's some sort of a disguised protectionism. The so-called social dumping is some sort of a disguised protectionist tool that is being used to avoid free trade. But is it always protectionism? Jaime Serra's argument assumes that if developing countries trade freely, their working standards will naturally improve as they develop. Undoubtedly, this has happened in countries like Korea. But will all developing countries gain from trade in this way? Professor Adrian Wood. I think you can actually lose from trade. You can lose, and I think the Dominican Republic is, is perhaps a good example of this. The Dominican Republic got very heavily into the production for exports of shirts and jeans and shoes but they got stuck there before they got into all these labor intensive exports they had a much more diversified industrial structure and they were engaged in a range of activities that were moderately skill intensive as well as as very labor intensive and those activities have basically disappeared and so the base from which they would be able to climb up the ladder of development uh, has been eroded. What we find is that some developing country governments and industries 
argue that they're on their way up the ladder even when there's evidence that nothing is improving for their workers. In other words, they use free trade, development and better working conditions merely as a political slogan. In this, they're no different from industrialists on the other side of the border arguing for workers to have rights, so long as they're in another country. But surely free trade needs to embody some basic standards and conditions. What about child labour and forced labour? Dennis McShane, a former international union official, is now a Labour Member of Parliament. The paradox of free trade is that it can become protectionist in the sense that the only people allowed access to the benefits of free trade are a relatively narrow elite. If free trade goes hand in hand with ever widening inequalities, if free trade goes hand in hand with a massive increase in child and bonded labour, if free trade is associated in the world's minds with the destruction of cultures and communities and a balanced way of life, then I'm afraid free trade won't survive. I am a committed free trader, but you need free trade plus for it to be win-win. Free trade has got to incorporate the right of everybody involved in it, from the humble producer of my morning coffee up to the most powerful multinational in the world. As officials took their morning coffee at this week's World Trade Organization meeting, some may have been thinking about its humble producer. A large group of countries led by the United States and France have been trying to persuade other members of the WTO to agree to a social clause, which would include the right to form unions and would ban forced labour and the exploitation of children, as well as discrimination in employment. This issue provoked more conflict than any other at this week's meeting in Singapore, and has been left substantially unresolved. Dennis McShane finds the reluctance to agree to a social clause disturbingly short-sighted. I think that the World Trade Organization will see quite a serious backlash against its guiding principles, which I support, if it refuses to discuss issues like child labor and if it refuses to discuss common agreed standards. The United States supports this position, France supports this position. Unfortunately, the British government is uh, pre-19th century and is saying you shouldn't discuss social rights in the regulation of world trade. It's a deeply reactionary and actually I think very un-British position to take. I absolutely understand the concern that some people do have about social standards in other countries. I share them. Ian Lang, President of the Board of Trade. We in Britain defer to nobody in our commitment to um, seeking to persuade people to abandon uh, the kind of uh, child labour or forced labour or whatever the standards might be uh, that we regard as unattractive. But those are issues that are being addressed already in other fora. And I don't myself regard the World Trade Organization as being the right forum in which to seek to carry them forward. The WTO is a rulemaking body. If it gets involved in uh, deciding how to approach uh, trade and labour standards as an issue, then ultimately it will end up setting rules uh, affecting those matters, and that would be an impediment to trade. There are some countries who have an inherent protectionist stance, uh, and who seek to use opportunities of this kind uh, as a screen behind which to shelter, uh, which is actually a, a protectionist screen. Ian Lang's view is that it's up to the International Labour Organization, the ILO, to deal with questions of child labour and workers' rights. But the trouble is that the ILO has no teeth. By contrast, trade sanctions can be a rather powerful lever. But there are bigger problems here. One argument for a social clause is moral. We want to reduce suffering in other countries. But in some countries, child labour is engaged in domestic services, not export industries and trade might well promise them better lives. The other argument for a social clause is that it makes trade fairer. Countries and companies have to compete on a level playing field. But this doesn't just involve labour standards. It takes us into how other societies and economies are organised. So just how far do we need to meddle in other countries in order to make trade fair? Vincent Cable. Well, in principle, you could go very far because, as we've already discovered in the European Union, if you're trying to create a genuine single market, um, you're concerned with many, many types of regulatory barriers, different kinds of uh, health and safety measures on the product side, all kind of regulatory controls governing quality. 
environmental uh, factors and so on. Uh, what Mrs. Thatcher once used the phrase about getting into the nooks and crannies of everyday life, which is a very good description about the way that the single market disciplines have applied. And if you're applying the the idea of a single market to the world, well, clearly, many, many aspects of national life come to be affected. When firms try to compete abroad, they soon find themselves getting stuck in the nooks and crannies of other economies, even where borders are open and protectionist barriers have been swept away. Suzanne Berger from MIT. I think that uh, people increasingly believe that the fairness of trade has to do with the conditions under which production takes place. Let's take the question about whether the pattern of Japanese ownership of large-scale enterprises, what the Japanese call the keiretsu, is that a fair way of producing goods? And for many Americans who believe that antitrust is the guarantee of uh, non-exploitative relations among companies, but what Japanese uh, company patterns look like is nothing more than sort of the big supplier beating up the little company. And so Americans felt, uh, why should we be forced to uh, see our industries die because goods produced under exploitative conditions, uh, conditions in which there are abuses of power, are produced more cheaply? Antitrust for Americans is about not letting monopolies set all the rules. But for many Japanese, their corporate arrangements, or kairetsu, look much less unfair than many of the United States' own practices. The problem about fairness is that not everyone agrees on what it is. Sadaki Numata is Minister Plenipotentiary at the Japanese Embassy in London. The question of fairness is a tricky one, because fairness can be a very subjective concept. And if one takes the view that a country which has a totally different economic or social organization from one's own country is by definition unfair, it does give rise to a whole lot of problems. A number of people have commented on the Japanese arrangements of Keiretsu as an example of a, a sort of invisible trade barrier. Keiretsu may be distorting trade in some instances, but there may be some good points about Keiretsu. And at the same time, there is another side of the coin, which is that some of the rather harsh trade measures taken by some countries, uh, including the United States, for example, anti-dumping duties. Uh, the, some of these measures, if abused, may distort competition in that country. So there are two aspects of the coin. Anti-dumping duties are fines imposed on importers at the drop of a hat, on the often spurious grounds that their goods are being sold at artificially low prices in order to drive out local competition. The other aspect of unfairness Sadaki Numata mentioned is much more difficult. In US-Japanese negotiations this month, the Japanese refused to bow to US pressure to deregulate their insurance industry. The Japanese argued that their priority is social harmony and an insurance system which is widely and equally available. Yet even as this dispute rumbles on, a lot of change is taking place. Japan is already undertaking a lot of deregulation. And this is not necessarily because the United States is cracking the whip. Perhaps this is a side product of the to and fro of trade and trade negotiations. Sadaki Numata. There is a very intensive debate going on in Japan about some of the assumptions that uh, have held true about our own economy. Uh, the, these assumptions have held true in the post-war period while we were trying to catch up with others and uh, while we were trying to rebuild our economy. But there are an increasing uh, number of people who are questioning these assumptions that some of these uh, management practices, uh, labor practices and so forth may no longer be applicable in this day and age. So, in a way, we are changing. And uh, one of the centerpieces of this change is this whole idea of deregulation or relaxing a whole lot of government regulations in order to uh, give free reign to the vitality of the private sector. This is something that we are choosing uh, for our own interest. But if we succeed in doing that, it will also have beneficial effects on our trading partners as well. But the important thing about this is that we are moving towards deregulation, not because we have been persuaded by somebody else's uh, concept of fairness, 
but because we think it is in our own interest to do that. On this view, voluntary change can succeed where international pressures have failed. Does Suzanne Berger from MIT agree with this interpretation? It's kind of interesting to look at what did change as a result of U.S.-Japanese negotiations in the 1980s, um, uh, 1990s. There the issue really was trying to talk about those conditions in Japanese domestic life that constituted real barriers to the entry of American goods. And I think that there was a lot of support in Japanese society as well for a certain measure of change. For example, in the rules about uh, large-scale supermarkets, the old rules had been very protective. It was very hard to open a store like Toys R Us in Japan. And there were groups within Japan as well that felt that this was wrong. As long as there is substantial domestic support, for measures of opening to the outside world, I think it's really possible for foreign pressure to have a real effect. I don't know if you've ever read the Dr. Doolittle books for children, but there's a mythical creature in the book called the Push Me Pull You. And it seems to me that trade pressures work best when they have this sort of push me pull you quality. That is, the foreigner pushing encounters domestic groups that wish to pull in this idea as a way of leveraging change in their own society. There's certainly been a lot of push-me-pull-you going on at the World Trade Organization this week as ministers search for shared standards. It's only the WTO that can enforce such standards, but the negotiations have a long way to go. All the participants are great believers in free trade. What they don't agree upon is what constitutes a level playing field, and for this reason, they're unlikely to agree on many shared standards. But even if they could, how far should convergence go? Should we trade away all our differences? Edward Goldsmith thinks we shouldn't, but that it's already happening. We're trying to create a homogeneous culture around the world. We're trying to impose on the world the same laws. We're trying to impose, I mean, the same consumer goods throughout the world. With the GATT agreements, that's precisely what, the, what we're doing. So the reason for that is we want to build a market. I mean, the people who are behind this, who want the free trade above all, are the large companies. And these large companies want to market their things worldwide. They want everybody to be drinking Coca-Cola. They want everybody to be eating McDonald's hamburgers. That's what they want. And for that to be possible, everybody must speak our language. Everybody must abide by laws. And there's laws everywhere to provide these companies with patents and to prevent any unfair competition, etc., etc., etc. You want to create one market. That's the object of creating a market. That is the whole object of the whole operation. Coca colonization and the sprouting of McDonald's all over the world are things some people love to rail against. Personally, I love being part of a world market that brings me a ready supply of Belgian chocolates. Why not let the Belgians make chocolate, the French champagne and the Americans Coca-Cola? This kind of specialization, based on comparative advantage, is exactly why many of us like free trade. But are there limits? Are there some things, deeper cultural traditions and differences, that we might want to protect from the dynamics of trade? Avner Offer is an economist at Nuffield College, Oxford, and specializes in quality of life issues. Although specialization might well be desirable in the production of commodities, I think the case for a balance, the whole repertoire of skills, abilities, sensibilities, sensitivities, is much more compelling in the cultural sphere. I think it stretches credence a little to say that uh, we should leave, uh, say, um, poetry to the French, cinema to the Americans, and we should only concentrate on costume TV drama. Uh, some people would find that uh, not entirely appealing, yes? There's also the consideration that this is a strategic issue. Um, one day we might find ourselves cut off from our source of poetry or from our source of uh, films, for example. So there's a case for a certain amount of uh, self-sufficiency here. But why is it more serious to risk being cut off from a supply of poetry than, say, a supply of champagne? One argument is that poetry or even soap operas, are not just consumer items. They're also a reflection of who we are, a window on our own society. They depict human experience in a particular place, at a moment in time. They leave a legacy for future generations. For all these reasons, we need to protect culture. And such reasoning is accepted by at least some free traders. Jagdish Bhagwati gives an example from recent trade talks. The French, during the Uruguay round, wanted to maintain their subsidies to the French cinema. And I thought the Americans were all wrong because they were being pushed by Jack Valenti, who was the chief uh, lobbyist for the motion 
Pictures Association. So um, they certainly, you know, were objecting to the French collecting a surcharge uh, on cinemas, which was then devoted to subsidizing the production of French cinema. No, and I thought it was utterly ridiculous to object to that. So I think if you could convince me that somehow free trade was really at the heart of the problem, or was in any particular instance going to do some damage to a, an important cultural aspect, uh, I would toss free trade out of the window f on that ground. But I think you'll usually find that people simply mm. worry uh, quite hysterically about this matter. And uh, I just don't see anything like that. The protection of culture, like the other issues we've discussed, can easily be used as an argument by vested interests, like filmmakers in search of subsidies. But equally, exporters in search of a larger market share can use the argument of free trade as a lever to push for their particular interests. In the example of the film industry, this doesn't mean that we end up with more of a free market. It means a few huge firms come to control more and more of the global market. When it comes to protectionism, every argument has a large subjective element. We all recognize some things we'd like to protect. Yet by doing so, we risk opening a door through which a whole host of interests, from captains of industry to seed farmers, will very soon charge. So what's the answer? Vincent Cable of Shell International. The crucial point about all this is that there should be some final court of appeal, some neutral body that can step back from the disputes between one country and another and say, well, this is, this is reasonable behavior. This is not protectionist behavior. Because as long as it's left to individual countries to decide for themselves, they're very likely to decide in favor of their own producer interest groups. And if it's left to two countries to battle it out, there will be a bilateral dispute, which is what's happened between the Americans and the Japanese, the Americans and the Chinese. So you need a strong multilateral body with legal credibility which can adjudicate in difficult cases. The idea that free trade is anarchy, is, is a world without rules, is utterly wrong. To, to have uh, freedom of trade and freedom of movement of, of investment also does require a strong system of international rules, a system of international law. Paradoxically, in Britain, many of those who push for free trade are very reluctant to cede any power to supranational bodies be it the WTO, or in a smaller free trade area, the European Union. There is a particular irony that people who've acted as a kind of lightning conductor to a lot of this frustration about the European Union are arguing very strenuously for what they would regard as a, a free trading area, but at the same time uh, playing on people's fear about loss of sovereignty. But m much of the so-called loss of sovereignty that has occurred was a direct consequence of the introduction of the single market within Europe, a free trading area, but which nonetheless had to address the barriers, uh, lots of regulatory barriers thrown up by different standards. And it was the necessity to introduce uh, a lot more majority voting within the European Union that was a direct result of the single market. So that this attempt on one hand to argue in favor of free trade on a European level at the same time to argue against loss of national sovereignty is very contradictory and I suspect the public are getting thoroughly confused by it. The government doesn't share this view. Trade and Industry Secretary Ian Lang sees no necessary contradiction between the Conservatives' enthusiasm for free trade and their reluctance to let international organizations do too much. Well, we believe that the single market is a market place in which nation states can and should be able to trade as freely as possible. That is our concept. It is not one of ever closer uh, scrutiny and control uh, by a power out with the nation state. And I think there is a very important distinction there. What worries me at the moment about what's happening in the European single market is that the idea of competition that is held in the breasts of some of our partners uh, is of bringing British competitiveness down to their levels whereas they should be seeking to raise their competitiveness to the levels they find in Japan or America or China. It, we have to look outward from Europe. We cannot regard Europe as an entirely self-contained and inward-looking trading bloc. The single market and the European Union only make sense if they are outward-looking and willing to play a full part uh, in the world trading scene. And that does mean a light regulatory touch uh, and as much freedom uh, as can be achieved and agreed. Freedom is something we all enjoy, but it has limits. Consumers enjoyed the freedom to buy cheap Chinese fireworks until we discovered that some of them are dangerous. What consumers now want is the freedom to buy safe firecrackers. And just as we saw for fair trade, safe trade requires global regulation, 
peering into other people's factories and safety standards. This is not necessarily a light touch. All markets need regulating. The famous invisible hand of Adam Smith's marketplace was never meant to pickpocket or pilfer. Yet in the modern world we find that the ideal of free trade is very easily confused with the more messy realities. Avner Offer from Nuffield College. Free trade as a concept is, is a utopian impossibility. We accept regulation all across the board. Our societies are heavily regulated. Every form of social redistribution is an intervention in the market. Immigration policy is quite interventionist in markets. So the talk about free trade is uh, a misnomer. It is, as, as an ideal, it is a utopia. Even the utopia of free trade, however, is not necessarily your or my image of heaven. Gains in GDP are not all that most people want. There are many goods which are not traded, which we value highly. For example, we value leisure highly. A lot of production takes place outside the marketplace in families and so on. We hear quite a lot about the family values these days. So a lot of goods do not register on a GDP. Uh, many of the values which uh, are deemed to be worth protecting are intangibles rather than traded goods. To the extent that we're talking about trade, it is only traded goods that we measure. But the intangibles and non-tradables and so on, we do not capture. Free trade is a way to improve economic growth. It's not a virtue in itself. Even committed free traders, when pushed, recognize that some things are worth protecting. Maybe not agriculture or an out-of-date welfare system, but perhaps our art and drama. But protectionism has to be heavily limited. Otherwise it becomes a racket, a large tax that all of us have to pay for those who've managed to wrap themselves in a national flag. This week's analysis, Trading Away Our Differences, was presented by Dr. Nairi Woods of the University College Oxford and was produced by Anthony Dworkin. The editor is Nicola Merrick.